Hello, Shadan. Welcome to this uh, official talk on CPIM Speak, which is the official YouTube channel of the Communist Party of India, Marxist. Shadan is a counsel for the CPIM and has fought uh, the case for CPIM in Supreme Court on electoral bonds. And we are going to discuss about the same issue with him. So Shadan, welcome and thanks a lot for giving us your time. I would like to start with the question that, can you just uh, shortly explain what the Supreme Court has said vis-a-vis -vis this entire judgment on electoral bonds? So I'll get into that in just a moment, but I just want to say that we were effectively the only, the CPIM that is, who I was representing in this case, was the only political party before the Supreme Court in the electoral bonds case. Most other political parties, even though they would have expressed their apprehension or, uh, you know, would have expressed their concern about the scheme, chose to take money under the scheme. And so CPIM and along with some other left parties were the very few parties, which were national parties or regional parties, who took the brunt of not actually uh, taking payment from this. And they took a principal stance that, listen, if we are opposing this, then we are not going to be, uh, you know, taking money. And they took up this thing and they challenged it. And uh, the outcome is actually a huge validation of the position the party took. Uh, constitutionally speaking, uh, it's a huge validation of the position the party took. Now, coming to uh, the question you have asked, effectively, the Supreme Court has junked the entire uh, process, uh, which the legal process, which was uh, envisaged to facilitate this scheme. And that was done through amendment in Income Tax Act, Representations of People's Act, and the Companies Act. And RBI Act as well, but the RBI Act one was just facilitative. It didn't really make any substantive changes. It really allowed entities such as the SBI to issue uh, the electoral bonds. The substantive changes, which were essential for the scheme, uh, in particular, the anonymity of the donor and the donee, those were the three amendments which I just mentioned. And the Supreme Court has approached it from two perspectives, constitutionally speaking. One is from the perspective of the right to know of the public, which is Article 19.1a. And uh, in that, it said that, listen, we are a functioning democracy, a constitutional democracy, and the people have a right to know about who is funding their political parties, because otherwise you can effectively have uh, interest uh, moneyed, which can hijack the entire process of uh, the electoral system, and the people won't even get to know of that. So I think that was the primary argument which we canvassed before the court and the court accepted that. Second, there was a question of arbitrariness and my, what, what in the constitutional language is called manifest arbitrariness. And there it found that this whole removal of uh, the 7.5% uh, limit, which is the as of 2017 when the amendment was introduced, a corporation could donate A, only if it was profit making and B, only 7.5% of its profit aggregate for the last three years. So it couldn't donate more than 7.5%. Uh, that uh, limit was completely undone with. That requirement itself was completely undone with by the amendment. So the net effect of that was that any company, irrespective of its financial health, whether it was loss-making or profit-making, anything, could actually make any amount of donations to uh, a political party and secretively and anonymously. And of course, you can understand how damaging that is from a, uh, you know, a democracy perspective. And that's what the court said, that these kind of donations, the, the limit on profit uh, was that part, companies which are otherwise healthy can donate to, to, uh, to the, uh, you know, different political setup. But if you have all kinds of parties which are not even making profit, the chances of quid pro quo in those kind of transactions is much higher because, um, you know, it's obvious. So they found that to be manifestly arbitrary as well. And so both the things were struck down. And very importantly, the consequence of that they have also a directed disclosure, which should hopefully happen in uh, early March and uh, by mid of March. Yeah. So just a follow up question. What was the government stand on this entire issue when you were fighting this case in the court? Yeah. So the government stand effectively was, listen, there is a cash economy which has been used for funding. This scheme, which prevents people from corporates from using cash because they were reluctant to be identified. And that's why they would pay through cash. Now that you have anonymized them, therefore, they are paying through this scheme because they are worried about retaliation, this, that, and the other when governments change. And therefore, this anonymized scheme is, you know, uh, facilitative while ensuring that black money doesn't come in, reducing uh, cash element, etc. And that's really the purpose of this scheme. This was despite the fact that the RPI and the Election Commission both had in initial years objected to the electoral bonds. 
Correct. So the RBI and uh, for different reasons, RBI and Election Commission both had objected. Election Commission subsequently, in fact, uh, subsequently in the court, Election Commission did not actually take a position. It's also a reflection on the continuous change we have been seeing in the nature of Election Commission's own independence. That having written such strong letters in the beginning of uh, when the scheme was sought to be introduced and was introduced, uh, later on, really, it just uh, did not contradict itself because in a constitutional court, how, how do you contradict letters which we have already written? But they were really a silent spectator to the whole thing, not really speaking against the scheme. And, and the government did not really produce material to show how those concerns of RBI and more particularly the election commission, which were raised, were addressed. Uh, the details of that uh, were, in fact, asked by the bench also during the uh, hearing, both from election commission as also from the government, that how were these concerns addressed, which of these concerns were addressed. And apart from making a blanket statement that they were addressed in subsequent to and fro communication, they did not produce any communication to show how it was addressed or how, in what manner it was addressed. So I was just reading through the submissions of the government and in one point they also mentioned that the citizens do not have right to know. Correct. So that argument was made, if I, uh, if I, if I remember correctly, by the attorney general in, in some form or the other. And he said the right to know really is limited to a more direct form of only vis-a-vis -vis the candidate there is no right to know about the political party and its funding. And even if it extends to a political party, it does not necessarily extend to the funding. And it was in that context that an argument was made. But of course, I mean, it, there's no, you know, there's no constitutional distinction uh, in why it should extend only to a, a person who's contesting the election and not to a political party. In fact, political parties exercise much of the political power today. So it will be totally ridiculous, constitutionally speaking, to have the right extent to, you know, the, the independent candidates when it's the parties which are exercising the real power. So I think that was uh, also therefore not accepted by the court. What led to the CPIM and you going to the court asking for uh, cancellation of the electoral bonds? Yes, I think the real thing was leadership of the party, I think, uh, was very clear. Mr. Yachuri, even when it was passed uh, uh, as an act, he had contacted me and he said, we must challenge this. It was something which uh, was quite against, I think, the principles of the way the party functioned. And so when it was finally, we waited for it to be notified because the act uh, obviously came in 2017 through so the Finance Act 2017. But the scheme itself was notified in January of 2018. And we immediately challenged after the scheme was notified because we wanted to see whether they will actually effectuate it, how do they bring it, what, etc. So once the scheme was notified, then we challenged both the amendments and the scheme. My final question would be, I mean, what is the way forward on this? Because there are also apprehensions that the government might do something to bring it back or not disclose the names? Given the track record of what this government has been trying in some other cases, like the Delhi government cases, etc. I mean, it's it's sort of, it can be expected uh, in terms of that they'll be thinking along some of those lines. But, you know, there's a, I think this judgment is going to make it very difficult for them to do any of those things for the simple reason that this is a judgment based simply purely on constitutional interpretation. It says that the constitution does not permit this. It does not go into anything else. Now, if the constitution doesn't permit it, unless you amend the constitution, you can't do it. You can't bring in an ordinance to save it. The judgment doesn't say this violates X act or Y act so that you amend the provisions of the act to change it through an ordinance or through an act of parliament. If they need to amend anything, they will need to amend 191A and article 14 of the constitution. And they can't, anything short of that is not really uh, of any legal consequence as far as trying to overturn the effect of this judgment, be it on the finding that it was unconstitutional or be it on the second aspect that these names should be declared in the public domain. Even on that second aspect, they cannot because that's a consequence of the finding of unconstitutionality of the scheme and the enactment. Now, unless you undo that, how do you protect what the outcome of that is? And since it's purely based on constitution, and I'll just inform your viewers, for constitutional amendment, there can't be an ordinance. They can, it's, it's, ordinance is only a replacement for a legislative regular enactment. There can, can never be a constitutional amendment through ordinance, number one. Number two, for a constitutional amendment, you require sitting and voting two-third members of each house. So that is number two. And number three, there can't be a joint sitting of parliament for a constitutional amendment. So really speaking, short of amending the constitution, which anyways you can't for other reasons also. How do you amend Article 14 and Article 19? They are fundamental precepts of what our constitution envisages. Right. But assuming for the sake of argument, you could in some way provide an exception or something like that. That's also not politically feasible because they simply don't have the numbers to do what, what, what that action will require.